Hello and welcome to Grits and the Gospel. This is Katie Griffiths. I am coming to you with a uh, worship service, a short worship service for the 23rd Sunday of Pentecost. Um, and uh, the original um, date for this is October 29th, 2023. I want to welcome you in the name of the Lord. If you are listening on uh, all the podcast apps or watching on YouTube, we welcome you in the name of the Lord. The Lord be with you and also with you. Hear now the words of Psalm 1, our lectionary psalm for the week. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or take the path that sinners tread or sit in the seats of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law they meditate day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water which yield their fruit in its season and the leaves do not wither and all they do they prosper. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. The words of the psalmist for us, the people of worship, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us say together the Apostles' Creed. Friends, what do we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we come to you today in a posture of worship and admiration. Here, let us hear the words of your psalmist and of your gospel and learn and grow in our time together. And let us always remember those words that your son Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Today's gospel lesson comes from the gospel according to Matthew. We are finishing the 22nd chapter this week, verses 34 through 46. Hear now the word of the Lord. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to them, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question. What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. He said to them, how is it then 
that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit in my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare ask him any more questions. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Merriam-Webster defines obsession as a persistent, disturbing preoccupation with an often unreasonable idea or feeling. We often find ourselves obsessed with different things. Like right now, I am obsessed with the unexpected cheddar from Trader Joe's. I love a sharp cheddar cheese. The sharper, the better. I love unexpected cheddar specifically because it is so sharp that it has crystals in it. It crunches when you eat it. I have three different types of unexpected cheddar in my fridge up the hill in the parsonage. I have two blocks. I have shredded and I have a delicious spread. I put it on crackers. I put it on chicken. I put it in scrambled eggs. I put it in grits. I love this cheese. It is a persistent, disturbing preoccupation and totally unreasonable, but I do not care at all. I am admittedly and unashamedly obsessed. Just like in the Gospel of Matthew that we just read, uh, the Pharisees have an obsession with Jesus. I feel like the Pharisees are in the same boat that I am. I feel like we need to pull them aside and look them in the eye and say, get a hold of yourself, guys. They are obsessed with Jesus and not in a totally healthy way that I'm obsessed with this cheese. They cannot help themselves. They cannot let go of the idea that Jesus is coming to take away all of their power and control. And if they don't do something to discredit him, all will be lost. For two chapters in Matthew now, we have seen time and time and time again, they have come at Jesus with everything they have. I particularly love verses 34 and 35. Verse 34 says, When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. The Greek word for silenced can be translated muzzled. Jesus didn't just silence the Sadducees. He kept them from speaking further. The Pharisees have taken a verbal tongue lashing after verbal tongue lashing from Jesus. Every time he shows them up, they come back for more. For weeks now, we have heard over and over in the lectionary the mic drops from Jesus. Their pride and arrogance keeps the Pharisees coming back with the thought that they can win. They have done it themselves. They have sent in other people like the scribes and the chief priests and the Herodians who all come back to them muzzled, unable to speak. But this time they send in their last hope, the big guns, <laughs> a lawyer. That shows you just how desperate they are to take back their perceived power from Jesus. Now, I come from a family of lawyers, and I have a lot of friends that are lawyers, so let me say, if any of my lawyer friends or family are listening, I am sure this Pharisee lawyer is not like you at all. The ones that I know and am close to are smarter than these guys. The ones I know are amazing humans that are honorable, and, in, and some are even preachers, which does seem like a little bit of an oxymoron. That being said, I cannot help but picture the mob attorney imagined by Hollywood. Like Better Call Saul, but worse. Like Billy Flynn, but slicker. But even the slick lawyer can't help himself and steps right in the middle of it with Jesus. 
I wonder if his fellow Pharisees warned him. I wonder if he had seen the others come back with their muzzles and thought, well, that won't happen to me. I wonder if he had not seen what happened to the others and the Pharisees sent him in blind. Either way, it was their pride and their arrogance that had taken them over and made them think they could win. But once again, and now don't be shocked here, Jesus takes them to task. They ask him a question and they think that will trap him up again. What is the greatest law, they ask. They are still caught up on the idea of Jesus breaking the law and how they can use that to retain their power. They're trying to beat Jesus so they can win. They are obsessed with the idea of keeping control of the people. Since his arrival in Jerusalem, since he threw people out of the temple, the religious leaders have asked a litany of questions to trap Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things and who gave you this authority? Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully and you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Then tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? If a man dies having no children, his brother must marry the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. This one is another question of technicality of the law and how Jesus sees the reality of following it. Thankfully, we don't have to worry about that one anymore. So in today's scripture, after trying all of these questions and hearing in parables how terrible they are over and over and over again, Jesus does his Jesus thing. Once again, they're hoping he will say something that goes against the law so they will have reason to prosecute and kill him so they can win and win the power that they are so obsessed with. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus gives them an answer that is very multi-layered and complex. Shocking, right? The first thing he does is hearken back to the law that they are trying to get him to deny and go against. He's doing the opposite of what they want. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. They ask for one, and he gives them two. Both are directly from the law. He gives them the only right answer, love God and love your neighbor. Sound familiar? That's another way the answer is so complex. It is foreshadowing of the Great Commission, foreshadowing of his death. This is nothing new. It is the basic law of believing in God. We are called to love God first and then to love our neighbor as yourself. All of the other laws that the Pharisees are worried about are part of one of these two categories. Laws about festivals and feasts, those are how they love God. Laws about what happens when you steal or kill all go back to how we love our neighbor. And just like the Pharisees have been asking Jesus questions, Jesus turns everything around back on them. Who is the Messiah? Don't you know that Jesus is totally winking at them? Like, come on, guys, I'm right here. I'm standing in front of you, and I've told you who I am for years now. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Come on now, guys. But they couldn't answer him. The Messiah was standing right in front of them and they couldn't answer him. They were so obsessed with the man in front of them and the power they thought he was taking that they couldn't see the Messiah. They were so obsessed with the with what clouds our vision. What are we so obsessed about? that clouds our vision of the Messiah. How are we so blinded by something, power, 
pride, distractions, false gods, that we cannot see the blessing of the Messiah standing right in front of us. It's easy to vilify the Pharisees. It's fun to poke fun of lawyers. If we see them in the story and not ourselves, it lets us off the hook for the times we can be like them instead of like Jesus. Well, I'm not that bad. <laughs> I'm not as bad as my neighbor over there who is very bad for so many reasons. The truth is, while we all can have times we are living a life that honors the Messiah, we can also be a Pharisee or a Sadducee or a chief priest or a Herodian, or clutch my pearls a lawyer. We all want power at some level. We all want to win at some level. Friends, what Jesus is trying his best to remind them and us about is this. The power was never ours to begin with. The power is, was, has always been, and will always be God's and God's alone. Love God. Don't take his power. And love your neighbor. Don't wield power over people. The scripture this week ends with this. No one was able to give him an answer. Nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. Hear that again. No one dared to ask any more questions. Notice the verse doesn't say they learned their lesson. Notice that it does not say they were giving up. They were regrouping to come back another way. They were coming back with pieces, with 30 pieces of silver. And the ultimate answer that Jesus will have for them is the power over death. This obsession drove them to the extreme. The obsession drove them to be terrified of losing their power. When all they ever needed was standing right in front of them. Maybe if they had been blessed with unexpected cheddar, it would have been enough of a distraction for an obsession. Or college football, or Harry Potter, or, I don't know, finding ways to love God and their neighbor. We begin our journey through Advent soon. It's so tempting to be obsessed with Christmas. And not the Christmas that we celebrate here at church but the one the world says we should be celebrating. Decorations have been up for a while now at stores. Even Chick-fil-A is selling the Lord's Chicken with garland and lights. It's so easy to see how we can become obsessed with the wrong thing during Advent. It is easy to see how we can fall into the trap that the Pharisees found themselves ensnared in. My hope for all, us all is that we become so obsessed with the Messiah that people around us see the real focus of Advent. That we look to him for all of the answers to our questions and we see Advent and Christmas for what it truly is. The start of the journey to the cross. Amen. As we go throughout our week, may we be obsessed with the Messiah. May we, be, may we find ways to show God love and to show our neighbor's love. As we answer that question, what is the greatest commandment? To love God and love each other. Because in life and death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.